People keep asking me, Tim, does ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, have any role in Bible prophecy? I've been asked that question several times, so today I'm going to share a brief update explaining the role of ISIS and its potential role in Bible prophecy. You're not going to find the term ISIS in prophecy, but we do have the King of the South in Daniel 11. And as I'm watching current events unfold, I am seeing a very close parallel uh, going on with Daniel 11's King of the South and King of the North in the third and final conflict. To give you an idea, first I've got to explain Daniel 11 before I actually get into the role of ISIS. Now, I'm going to cover this in very short form here, in abbreviated form, but if you would like to get more detail and the historical facts behind it, I'd encourage you to go to our website, islamandchristianity.org. We have it right here on the screen. And there, you'll be able to find the detail of what I'm just going to summarize today. In Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and 8, Daniel goes through a whole list of powers. It was an image of different metals in Daniel 2. It's different beast in Daniel 7 and 8. Daniel and God use symbols to describe world history, starting in Babylon. Then we have Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, and then uh, with the little horn. So we have these parallel prophecies, starting in Daniel's time, ending with God's kingdom. Now, Daniel 11 will cover the same territory, but this time it's going to talk about a king of the north and a king of the south. You see, in Daniel 11, we have a king of the north that invades Jerusalem from the north. The Persians are the first one, and they take over from Babylon, and they occupy Jerusalem from the north. Jeremiah in chapter 50 even calls the Persians, the kingdom of the north. So we have them coming down on Jerusalem from the north. Now in Daniel 11, north and south are relative from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the focal point of this prophecy. Next we have the Greek empire. And the Greeks come in from the north. And once again, they fit in. And Jerusalem is attacked from the north. All the powers of Daniel 2 and 7 attack Jerusalem from the north. But then the Greek empire splits. Seleucid north, Ptolemy south. And you'll notice that Jerusalem gets caught right there in the middle. And so from this time on, God's people are caught in the middle. Even Jesus will die in verse 22, which happens to be right in the middle of the prophecy. So Christ and his people are always caught in the middle. But by the way, you want to be in the middle because Jesus will rescue those people caught in the middle at the end of this prophecy. Then we have the Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, again, Rome comes into Israel from the north. And so they are a kingdom of the north. And then the Roman Empire splits. We have the whole northern part of the Mediterranean world go Christian, and the southern part goes Islamic. Now, if you'll notice down here, from Mecca and Medina, Islam comes up from the north and hits Jerusalem, I mean from the south, and they attack Jerusalem from the south. Meanwhile, after they take over the Middle East and North Africa, papal-led Christianity comes in from the north in the Crusades. Now understand this. The Christian world follows the papacy at the time of the Crusades because they are afraid of a spread of Islam. Now, we're going to find that there are three of these conflicts. Christian North, Islamic South, Jerusalem always gets caught in the middle. Friends, if you were to visit Jerusalem today, you would have the feeling that it is a city caught in the middle. Now, there are three conflicts, as I mentioned. Verses 25 to 28, after the breakup of Rome, we have the first one, the Crusades, which was divided Rome, Christian North, Islamic South. Then, verses 29 to 39, during the time of the Reformation, we have the second conflict between Islam and Christianity, which is the Ottoman Islamic Empire. And then, in verses 40 to 45, we have the time of the end, which is the third and final conflict between Islam and the Christian West and its aftermath. Well, there are three conflicts. Arab Islam with the Crusades, Ottoman Islamic Empire at the time of the Reformation, and the time of the end, radical Islam. In the first one, the Christian world follows um, the papacy because of the afraid of the spread of Islam. The second one, the world follows the papacy because of the spread of Islam. And the third one, what would you expect? Now that radical Islam is considered a threat all over, and the papacy is beginning to resurge in power as well, 
hey, if there is a holy war, Islam on one side, who would lead the Christian nations? Again, it's rather simple. That would be the papacy. History is repeating itself for the third time. People ask, um, do, does the God of Christianity and the God of Islam, is that the same God? Well, they both claim that they're the God of Abraham. Well, where does that leave us? Does it make them the same? As people say, oh, but we have all these terrible things happening. Exactly. Jesus said, by your fruits you shall know them. It's not by what they claim, it's by what they do. So let's take a look. During the time of the Crusades, which side, the Christian Crusaders or the Muslims, acted in a Christ-like way and loved their enemies? We say, well, neither did. That's true. God's people always get caught in the middle. And so we find, as I look at history, that many Christians are serving the same false god as many Muslims, a false god of force, fear, and anger, do it our way or else. While a few Christians and a few Muslims are in search of or have found the same true god of love, truth, peace, and forgiveness. So a majority probably of Christians and Muslims are serving a false god, while some Christians and some Muslims have found or are in search of the true God. Always make sure that you're following Jesus Christ and the Bible, and you will be following the true God. It's not what you say, it's what you do. And as you see this prophecy unfold, it's time to recognize, it's time to do and follow what the Bible says. It's not a time to be messing around anymore in this world. It's a time to take life seriously and to take Jesus Christ seriously. Now, remember I mentioned there are three uh, conflicts between Islam and Christianity from the breakup of the Roman Empire. Now, that's not just my words. Take a look at Patrick Buchanan. Uh, back in July of 2011, he said the following, As for a climatic conflict between a once Christian West and an Islamic world that is growing in numbers and advancing inexorably into Europe for the third time in 14 centuries. Friends, we're looking at the third conflict since the breakup of Rome. It's in the history. This isn't my imagination. This is historical stuff. And Daniel says that there are three conflicts. What Patrick Buchanan doesn't know is that this is the third and final conflict between Islam and Christianity that is brewing and is about to really break out into the open. Let's look at what Daniel actually says and how he describes this third and final conflict between Islam and Christianity. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. I want you to notice two things here. Number one, the king of the south, Islam, pushes first. That's radical Islam hitting in jihad or holy war fashion. Second, it is like a whirlwind. Once the king of the north comes into this fray, you have it now like a whirlwind, which means it's very fast once that happens. And notice the military language. It comes in like uh, he enters the countries, he overwhelms them and passes through. So it will be very rapid and very climactic once this conflict happens. So it starts with the king of the south pushing, jihad, holy war first, but later, Christianity, and again, in the first two conflicts, it was papal-led Christianity. So I'm seeing when the papacy takes a role of initiating conflict against radical Islam, we have entered the third conflict, and it will be like a whirlwind. In the times past, I was always just saying, there's going to be a time when the Pope stands up and says, I know I'm the man of peace, but the only way to eradicate this turmoil in the world is to take out those who just will not cooperate. And the time has come to take out radical Islam. The thing of it is, he's beginning to say those kind of things. And that's where I see the role of ISIS in Bible prophecy. So, he continues, He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hands, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. He shall stretch out his hands against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. I want you to notice he's naming countries here, just like he did at the beginning. And when he said Persia, he meant Persia. When he said Greece, he meant Greece. So I'm expecting he actually means Egypt here. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. All right, so we've got names being named. We have three conflicts. We've had the first one back in the Arab Islam, followed by the Crusades. 
Then we have the Ottoman Islamic Empire. Both the papacy and Islam go down and are weak for a while, but both are resurging, and we're headed for a third and final conflict between these two. We are just entering this third conflict that will be very short, and Islam will be divided when it happens. It will be divided three ways. One part will escape. I'm going to come back and talk about that in just a bit. The second part will be overthrown, which is Egypt in many countries. And the third part will follow after. Now, let me explain these for a bit. Again, I mentioned that Egypt, I believe, is literal. However, let me add to that. The king of the north is literal or geopolitical, leads real armies in the real conflict in the Crusades and the Ottoman Empire. But it's also spiritual. In Daniel 11, it works or fights against the covenant of God. So it is geopolitical and spiritual. Islam is geopolitical and spiritual. It has real territories, real armies, but it also is a spiritual power. So I am seeing that after the time of Jesus in verse 22, every power listed is both geopolitical and spiritual. Thus, Egypt would be the country of Egypt, but it would also be radical Islam and many of the countries that follow after it. Now, then you have those that will follow the king of the north, papal-led Christianity. Yes, Islamic nations would follow papal-led Christianity in this third and final conflict. And it lists Libya and Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a mix of Christian and Muslim. Libya, on the other hand, is more Muslim. And so what I'm seeing is that we have moderate Islam that follows the papacy while radical Islam is destroyed. And the parallel, as you notice, in Revelation 13.3, and it says, All the world marveled and followed the beast. Just before God sets up his kingdom, we have the world following this power. In Daniel 11, it's the king of the north. In Revelation, it's the beast. I'm looking at it being papal-led Christianity. If you want to see why, take a look at our website on the second presentation, which is the king of the north in this final conflict, the beast power in Revelation. And we go through the details there. Now, the good news piece is the part that escapes. They are delivered by Christ. In Daniel 12.1, we have um, those that are recorded in the book that are delivered. That's the same word that we had in Daniel 11 for Edom, Moab, and Ammon when they are, are escaping. Same Hebrew word, one translated escape, one delivered. Now, this is right when God is setting up his kingdom, and the parallel in Revelation is very interesting as well. Let's take a look at that together. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Daniel 12, Revelation 17. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life when they see the beast. So in Daniel 12, we have those that are delivered, that are in the book. Revelation 17. Who's in the book? those who are not following the beast, but are in the Lamb's book of life. Now in Daniel 11, we have Edom and Moab and Ammon. They don't follow, they escape. But the rest of the Islamic world is either overthrown or follows the king of the north. Hence, those that escape have to be the same as those that are in the Lamb's book of life in Revelation. Those are the ones that are delivered when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom. Now, New Testament picks up the term escape for those who are Christian. Take a look at this. And they shall not escape, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Well, who escapes? Those who are trusting in Jesus Christ. Edom, Moab, and Ammon escape. They have to be trusting in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Again, those who escape are those who are trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, an exciting piece to me came when I was looking at a map of the Davidic kingdom. Now, notice we have Israel over here with Jerusalem. But off to the east of them, we have Edom, Moab, and Ammon. That's within the Davidic kingdom. And the New Testament and Old Testament all indicate that when Jesus sets up his kingdom, he restores the Davidic kingdom. Well, if he restores the Davidic kingdom, Edom, Moab, and Ammon will be a part of it. So, since Daniel 11 says Edom, Moab, and Ammon escape, and all these things come together, it indicates that there are going to be a group of Muslims who take a stand for Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and follow what the Bible actually teaches. And just like in all history, those that do that will get caught in the middle. Think back to the Reformation, the Dark Ages. What would happen to somebody up in papal-led Christianity territory 
if they took a stand for Jesus in the Bible and they started preaching on the streets and they gave away Bibles, they would be killed in times past, burned at the stake. What happens if they went down to the southern part of the Islam, uh, Mediterranean world, into the Islamic world, and started handing out Bibles and teaching about Jesus Christ and about following him? They too would be killed. You see, just like Jerusalem is caught in the middle, any of God's people of faith, no matter where they are in the world, are caught in the middle. This is both geopolitical and spiritual. Everything fits perfectly when you re understand it that way. So now, how does ISIS fit into this? Well, remember, it's when the king of the north uh, joins the attack. First, the king of the south pushes, gets the king of the north mad, and when the king of the north, papal-led Christianity, enters the fray, then it will go like a whirlwind, and it will be a very dramatic event right after that. Let's take a look. What has been happening uh, in the month of August 2014? We've had the rise of ISIS. Most people didn't really hear of ISIS before July and August of 2014. Well, it was known. But take a look. In January of 2014, we have war on terror. President Obama says, post bin Laden, al-Qaeda's control of more territory than ever doesn't matter because it's a junior varsity high school basketball team. Uh, that was Investor's Business Daily. So early in this year, it was considered that radical Islam wasn't all that dangerous. Um, yeah, they were controlling lots of territory, but hey, it was desert. Who cares? And this is the power that is now called ISIS, the IS, Islamic State. ISIS, by the way, is Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIL, Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. And by the way, a lot of our politicians want to use ISIS or ISIL when they speak, because that means we're talking about the Fertile Crescent, and that's indicating that that's all that the Islamic State is interested in. However, the Islamic State themselves doesn't like those terms. It likes Islamic State better, because their goals are much grander and greater than just the Fertile Crescent. They want to take over the world. Let's see what they actually have to say. In July 1, the Telegraph reports, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the self-proclaimed leader of the Islamic State stretching across Iraq and Syria, has vowed to lead the conquest of Rome. He's called on Muslims to immigrate to his new land to fight under its banner around the globe. Notice a couple of things. One, he's calling fighters in from all over the world, and that's been happening. Another thing is, he's looking at going after Rome, he said so, and taking over the globe, the world. He is not just interested in the Fertile Crescent. He is interested in having a caliphate or an Islamic state, Islamic law, that stretches around the world. Now, the scary thing is that a poll was taken, uh, issued on July 22, the result, that 92% of the Saudi citizens believe that the Islamic state conforms to the values of Islam and Islamic law. Wow. That has scared the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The leaders are really worried about that one because they are worried about this radical Islam coming into their territory. Now, as we come through July, the Islamic State is rapidly pushing their way across Iraq and Syria, especially into Iraq. The Iraqi military is disfolding, and even the Kurdish military is falling before them. Uh, up in the northern part of Iraq. And so they're overrunning uh, Shia Muslims and killing them. They're Christians, Yazidis, and there were thousands of people at risk. And on August 7, the Pope, the King of the North, and Daniel 11, makes a statement. Pope Francis appealed to the world leaders on Thursday to help end the crisis in northern Iraq after a sweeping advance by radical Islamic State militants forced thousands of residents in Iraq's biggest Christian town to flee their homes. His Holiness addressed an urgent appeal to the international community to take action to end the humanitarian tragedy now underway. When I heard that one that day, I thought we might be on the very verge of this third conflict happening, and I still believe that may be true. Let's continue to look at a few other statements. The Weekly Standard on August 8 said, um, quoting Obama, America is coming to help. That was the title of their 
their article. The very next day, the United States has its first air attacks on the Islamic State positions. Then August 11, uh, it was an article from the Catholic on, uh, Online. The title of the article is Chaldean Patriarch Calls for Armed Response to Defend Christians from Genocide. It's interesting. The first version of it, the first title said, the Pope calls for armed response to defend Christians from genocide. But they got the quote just a little bit wrong, so they re renamed it. And uh, now we have the following. Referring to military action, Archbishop Giorgio Lingua, the Vatican's nuncio to Iraq, told Vatican Radio, this is something that had to be done, otherwise the Islamic State could not be stopped. So military action is something that had to be done, comes from a Vatican ambassador. So the Pope calls for action, and now we're having statements, and the Catholic Online picks it up. They continue. Such a call is virtually unprecedented for a papal envoy in modern times, but our age is an extraordinary one, and the Islamic State has no interest in a bargaining table. Instead, the Islamic State is bent on genocide and barbarism, ruthlessly exterminating anyone who opposes them. So, they're recognizing that this is something unusual. You see, friends, up until the month of August, the papacy has been resisting conflicts between Islam and Christianity. It's not been really since the Ottoman Empire went down that the papacy has called for any kind of action, military action. But now we're having it. What has changed? Here's another quote from Breitbart on August 13. Vatican approval of Iraq strikes a rare exception to peace policy. The Holy See's ambassador to the United Nations, Silvano Tamasi, this weekend supported U.S. airstrikes aimed at halting the advance of Sunni Islamic State, the IS, militants, calling for an intervention now before it's too late. So here we have another ambassador to the Vatican endorsing military action. Military action might be necessary, he said. While the Vatican vocally disapproved of the U.S.-led campaign in Iraq, in 2003 and the 2013 plan for airstrikes on Syria, fearing both might make the situation worse for Christians on the ground, fears of ethnic cleansing by Islamists has forced a policy change. The king of the south has been pushing and it's forced a policy change for the king of the north. We are at the tipping point, it looks like. Time will tell, but it appears we are at the tipping point when the king of the north enters the fray and at that point it will go like a whirlwind once this thing takes off, based on the prophecy. August 20, the Islamic State beheads an American citizen, journalist James Foley, and puts it on the internet for the world to watch. And then says they're going to do it again and do uh, a few, two weeks later. August 21, Rudders, Islamic State threats beyond anything we've seen. This is from the Pentagon. The sophistication, wealth, and military might of Islamic State militants represent a major threat to the United States that may surpass that once posed by Al-Qaeda, U.S. military leader said on Thursday. Here's why. In their radical expansion across Syria and Iraq, they not only got all the military hardware that those armies left behind, they also took the banks, so they had the money. They have oil fields, and refineries, so they're selling and ha they have oil and all this kind of stuff to run all their military machinery. They also have been stealing all the antiquities and selling them on the black market. These guys are having millions of dollars of income a day to keep their operation going. And so with success, they are drawing fighters from all over the world to join with them, and they have become very dangerous. Um, the Weekly Standard on August 22, a U.S. general destroyed the Islamic State now. General John Allen, who is retired from the military, says that the Islamic State, known as ISIS or ISIL or IS, must be destroyed now. Now, if you listen to talk radio and news commentators and all these kind of things, you're hearing, and even religious people and pastors and all the rest, you're hearing people coming out and saying, these people are a cancer, they're dangerous, they must be eliminated. It's not stopped, it's not make them surrender, it is eliminate them, kill them, wipe them out. You hear all those kind of statements. Then, 
Remember that we have the king of the south and the king of the north in conflict? Take a look at this statement. El Tempo, Italian magazine, the Pope targeted by Islamic fundamentalists. The group of Islamic fundamentalists led by al-Baghdadi, this is the IS, also plans to raise the level of confrontation, still hitting Europe and even Italy in particular. In particular, Israeli sources believe that there is also in the crosshairs of the ISS Pope Francis, the greatest exponent of the Christian religion as the bearer of false truth. Now just understand, if the Islamic State views Christians as infidels, then the greatest infidel of them all to the Islamic State would be the person that the world views as the leader of Christianity, and that would be the papacy. So they're in the crosshairs. Again, the king of the south is pushing against the king of the north. If they were to take any action and attack the Vatican or Pope Francis, we would be definitely tipped over the edge and into this third and final conflict. But there are Muslims that are now beginning to side with the West or the Christian powers. Just as the prophecy indicates, we would eventually have Libya, Ethiopia, moderate Islam siding with papal-led Christianity. Here, the outlook from India says the Muslim world is in dire need to take cognizance of the threats posed by anti-Islamic outfits. The militant groups among Muslims are causing harm to Islam in the false garb of Islamists. Any support or endorsement to the extremist and terror organization goes completely against the Islamic Sharia, the Sunni Sufi Islamic scholar said. And so here we have a Islamic scholar saying, do not follow the Islamic State. They are not legitimate. Now that argument is waging. Remember, 92% of Saudi citizens are thinking it is legitimate. And here's a scholar saying it's not. So we're having a divide in the Islamic world. And Daniel 11 says, radical Islam is destroyed. Moderate Islam follows papal-led Christianity. But a third part actually take a stand for Jesus Christ in the Bible. Um, also, President Obama on September 3rd, 2014, recorded in Breitbart. What we've got to do is make sure that we are organizing the Arab world, the Middle East, the Muslim world, along with the international community to isolate this cancer. He wants to isolate a cancer. What do you do when you isolate it? You cut it out and get rid of it. And so you've got that mentality going. Friends, we've got the idea of a holy war actually really forming up in our world today. And ISIS has been a triggering factor in bringing to a head the issues that were already there but to me, the most crucial part is when the papacy takes its move and moves from uh, opposing military action to calling for it. That is the biggest event that I can remember in my lifetime of study on Daniel 11 and on this issue. So what we're looking at is that this third conflict, we have the king of the south push the king of the north, and when the king of the north retaliates, it's a very quick fall of radical Islam. And friends, I'm thinking that might be just around the corner. Do I know it? Not for sure. We could sit here right at this tipping point for a little while and not be quite sure when we're going to tip over the edge. Pressure could back off. But as I said, this is the first time that I can remember where the papacy has come out in favor of military action against Islam since the time of the Ottoman Empire. That was back in the second conflict. Now we're at the third. And that was the tipping point that I'm watching for. Let's take a look at what happens immediately after that third and final conflict. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. I want you to notice the king of the north is brought to its end as well. The king of the north is not a power that is supporting God's word. The papacy has killed millions of people over the years who refused to follow their rules. That wanted They wanted to follow the Bible instead. If you wanted to follow the Bible during the time of the Reformation or earlier, you could be burned at the stake. So the king of the north and the king of the south are both bad actors in this prophecy with God's people caught in the middle. Now the idea here is that we've got a message that comes from the east and the north that shall trouble him. Um, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, by the way, are to the east of Jerusalem. 
God's remnant that comes out of Islam share the last warning message with the world, along with a remnant in Revelation says out of Babylon, the king of the north. Uh, so out of Christianity and out of Islam, you get these two groups that together take a stand for Jesus in the Bible. And when they share that last message to the world, the king of the north gets very angry. The parallel in Revelation is the mark of the beast imagery. And so during this little time, right following the third conflict, we have the loud cry of Revelation, tidings from the east, tidings from the north, the last warning message that goes out to the world. I want you to understand, folks, we are looking at the tipping point. And then we have the last message to the world. And then the closing events of Earth's history that I describe in our full presentation uh, on IslamandChristianity.org. If you'll watch that, it's Michael stands up. There's a time of trouble like there's never been. God delivers his people and there's a resurrection of the saved and a resurrection of the lost. And God's people live with him forever. And so, friends, what this indicates to me is that from the last conf part of the conflict of Daniel 11, we've been since the 1800s thereabouts, since we've had any clear action. And now we are what it appears to be right at this tipping point of the third and final conflict. And from there on, it's like a whirlwind, final rapid movements. Uh, and God's people get caught in the middle. But good news is he rescues them. And... Again, you can check out our website for the details. Let me just touch base on a couple of other issues going on. You might say, do I know that ISIS is the trigger point? Not for sure. But I have never seen it come this close to this prophecy since I've been studying it. But there are some other issues that we need to keep our eyes on as well. In Libya, 11 passenger planes were went missing just recently when a radical Islamic group took over the Tripoli airport. Passenger planes can be loaded with fuel and explosives and be a fearsome weapon because they can be passed off as a passenger plane and fly into a space and cause great damage. Just like on September 11, 2001, we saw that here in the United States. So there are these 11 missing passenger jets that are of concern. Also in Pakistan, we have great turmoil politically going on there. What's the big deal? Well, Pakistan is the um, Islamic uh, nuclear power in the world. And if they go into a radical Islamic takeover in the government there, then radical Islam would then have nuclear weapons. Hamas and Hezbollah, they're there because they could just attack Israel at any moment, and Israel gets caught in there, and it could bring the world into a conflict that way. Uh, you've watched that come close many times. We have the Syrian conflict, where Sunni and Shia Muslims are in conflict there with Assad. And that one could spin out of control even worse. It's already been the breeding ground for the Islamic State. Then there's Al-Qaeda, who might just simply want to get back in the headlines and pull off a big event, uh, because they've been, you know, the Islamic State's taken over the headlines, and they want to have them back. They could do something. Boko Haram, a terrorist radical Islamic group in northern Nigeria. I visited that area, northern Nigeria, earlier this summer, and I did get to talk to quite a few Christians there that had once been Muslim. They had dreams and visions leading them to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. God is preparing his remnant even now in the Islamic world. Everything appears to be getting ready. Then there's Iran. Iran's been kind of quiet lately. But maybe they want to come back in the headlines. All they have to do is to start enriching nuclear fuel and head towards developing a nuclear weapon. And things would really get hot in that way. And then there's the Ebola. Africa, and as that moves up possibly towards the Islamic world and all this conflict area, you have military, spiritual, and disease conflict all mixing in. We have a world that's in chaos. Things are in changing. And then... Just in a few days after filming this will be September 11. And what will happen September 11, 2014? Radical Islam has a interest in things like that date. September 11, 2001, attack on the World Trade Center. September 11, a couple years ago, September 11, 2012, was the attack on the Benghazi consulate. And the ambassador from the U.S. was killed, along with several other people trying to defend the consulate. So... There are lots of things to keep an eye on. There are some challenges. Have all the pieces of the puzzle fit? No, they haven't. Here are the challenges. Uh, number one is Egypt. Why Egypt? 
Because in Daniel 11, it says Egypt will be overthrown. I shared with you how that would be radical Islam. Egypt was the birthplace of current radical Muslims. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood begins in Egypt in the 1920s. However, Egypt today is not uh, controlled by radical Islam. It's controlled by the military. The Brotherhood was pushed out of power a couple of years ago. However, they would like to retake power. And my understanding of Daniel 11 is that somehow Egypt radicalizes, and in this third conflict, they are overthrown by the king of the north. Now, Libya, according to Daniel 11, will side with the king of the north that will follow. Well, Libya right now is a toss-up. We have moderate Muslims and radical Muslims in conflict, and Libya is a dangerous place in this conflict. But based on Daniel 11, I am believing that moderate Islam wins, and when it comes to the final showdown between king of the north, king of the south, that Libya will go with the king of the north, papal-led Christianity, the western powers, kind of, don't kill us, we'll cooperate. Why? Because Libya has great oil riches and resources, and they'd like to share them just across to the north on the other side of the Mediterranean to the European world. And so Libya uh, makes all the sense in the world that eventually, if the people had their choice, it would be moderate. But these are the challenges you need to watch for Egypt radicalizing Libya, uh, actually moderating and following the Western world, and watch for continued um, endorsement of military action by the papacy or even stronger calls. As these things get stronger, we know we're entering. Are we there yet? We look to be on the edge. And people ask me, are you positive you're right? Well, I'm human. I could be wrong. However, Daniel 11 has been historically accurate for 2,500 years in the order of events as written. And so I believe that when the king of the north, which was papal-led Christianity, the Crusades and the Ottoman Empire, when the king of the north, papal-led Christianity, enters the fray against Islam and it becomes a holy war, it will be a very short conflict, will be followed by the final message, and then God's kingdom will be established. So those are the things that I'd really like to challenge you to keep in mind. Now is the time to be following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now is the time to be studying Scripture seriously. Time may be almost over. Don't wait for later. We have a book out on this topic. It was produced in 2011. And so it's a little more generic because it's just based on the prophecy. ISIS wasn't even on the scene yet. But Islam and Christianity and Bible prophecy, you can get that book on Amazon or from our website, islamandchristianity.org. You can also get all 10 of our videos that explain part by part all the way through Daniel 11. Uh, so you can study that, and there are study guides there. We do public 10-day seminars, and that's what you find on our website. If you or your church are interested, and it doesn't matter what denomination, I'm willing to talk to somebody from any denomination, um, contact us on our website and give us an invitation to come to your church. We also do conventions and special events. Um, I spend the majority of the year uh, traveling and doing presentations all over the world. Also, if you... Uh, send me a message on our website. We'll be connecting you to, to receive our updates, which will give you added information on what might be happening in current events and in Bible prophecy. So I do want to encourage you. This prophecy has been right for 2,500 years. Now is the time to take the Bible seriously. Trust in Jesus Christ and if you're trusting in him, you don't need to be afraid because this is telling us that it's almost to the point where Jesus sets up his kingdom. And that ultimately, friend, is really good news. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in him. And you don't need to be afraid. May God bless you as you continue to study and share it with the world around you. Encourage people to watch this. Read our book. Read the Bible. Trust in Jesus. It's time to share a message that Jesus loves you and he's coming soon. Thank you.
been a production of Sealing Time Ministries. For more programs like this and other exciting topics and speakers, you can visit our website at www.sealingtime.com.